here we are. Hello, everybody. It is time for our first logic lesson. Um, I am a logic tutor at a community college in California, and I thought that it would really help some of my students if I did some videos on natural deduction, because it seems like when students are going through the logic curriculum, um, that's kind of the most difficult part for them. So in order to explain that properly, I'm going to start with a brief introduction to propositional logic, because natural deduction sort of falls under the umbrella of that topic. And the text we're going to be using is Introduction to Logic, um, taught by Dr. Christopher Gilbert, and he actually wrote the portion of the book that I'm going to be teaching from. So if you have this class, hopefully this will help you out. I'm going to go through and do a lot of the homework problems in the natural deduction section, so you can really be able to watch them, you know, go step by step, and hopefully that will help you understand it a little bit better. So starting off with propositional logic, um, it's kind of a way to express simple English ideas with symbols so we can manipulate them, move them around, and see if arguments are valid or not. So it just basically starts out with capital letters of the alphabet, like say a T. And that would be used to express a really simple idea, like Trevor is going shopping. The idea of Trevor's going shopping, we use a T to express that. Or Susie likes cars, we could use an S. Pretty much the letters usually just go with the beginning of the sentence or one of the key words in the sentence. So you can use any capital letter in the alphabet pretty much to symbolize any idea. Um, the main point is that it's just a really simple idea, whatever it is. So that doesn't help us very much if we don't have any way to relate the letters to each other. And that's where we really get into the meat of propositional logic. What we do is we have five symbols that are used to relate the different ideas to each other. So maybe instead of just saying that I have an apple, or just saying that you have a banana, I could say I have an apple and you have a banana. Well now, if we were looking at it from the English perspective, that's a compound sentence. So we need some sort of connector in there. And that brings us to our first symbol, which is and. And and is symbolized by a little dot, looks like this. And that dot is also referred to as a conjunction. So it has three names, dot and conjunction. Your teacher will probably use all three of them kind of interchangeably. So if you can be familiar with the terminology, it'll really help. So things we can express with and. I have an apple and you have a banana. A and B. Or Trevor likes trucks and Susie likes skateboards. T and S. And all you do is you put the little dot right between the letters. And it expresses the idea that both letters are true. Whatever they mean, both of those things are true. So that's the first one. Moving on, the second one is or. Maybe I don't want to say that both things are true. I want to say that the first one's true or the second one's true. So I have an apple or you have a banana. That would be A or B. And so the symbol that goes with that is a little wedge symbol. It looks like a little V. And that one also has three names. You can call it a wedge. You can call it or. Or you can call it a disjunction. So similar to the conjunction, which is and, now we have the disjunction. So again, ways to use or. We could have I like ice cream. I. Or I like pizza. P. I or P. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be true at the same time. All it tells you is that at least one of them is true. So either I like ice cream or I like pasta, I or P. They could both be true, but we know for sure that they're not going to be both false. It's the first one or the second one. After that, now we have, we've had and, which is the dot. We've had or, which is the wedge. After that, we have what's called the horseshoe, or conditional. And the statement that that goes along with is the if-then statement. So it's if 
the first idea, then the second idea. So again, back to our apple and banana. It would be expressed in the idea, if I have an apple, then you have a banana. Which would be written A, horseshoe, B. Again, horseshoe is going to have three names, horseshoe, or conditional, or it can mean if then. So those are the three things you can call it. Okay, anyway, so next one is the triple bar. And in English, this symbolizes, this goes along with the idea if and only if. Just like two if then statements, one going this way, one going the other way. Looks like three little bars, one on top of the other. This one has three names too. It's either called a triple bar, a biconditional, or the if and only if, or IFF. And that's for things that are kind of, that are equal to each other. So, say you've got an apple. Well, here's a little Spanish lesson. In Spanish, the word for apple is manzana. So we could say something is an apple if and only if it is also a manzana. So here we have A, triple bar, M. It's like a little equal sign. It goes between the A and the M, showing that the two things they stand for are equal to each other. Okay, so we've had four symbols so far. We've had and, or, if then, and if and only if. Other names for these are dot, wedge, horseshoe, and triple bar. And the fancy schmancy names for them are conjunction, disjunction, conditional, and biconditional.